Well, hi everyone, and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy, and this is our second episode of Vaccines, Friend or Foe? How is a parent to decide? As many of you may know, I'm an internal medicine physician. I'm also a vaccinated father of vaccinated children. I am not directly involved in doing vaccinations in my practice, but I'm a firm believer in preventative public health care. As I mentioned in the previous episode, my driver's ed partner died at 16 when I was in high school of meningitis. We will be addressing meningitis in this episode. A good friend of mine died at age 45 of H1N1 influenza. We'll also be addressing that. And in college, when I was working as a paramedic in Lansing, Michigan, I transported a polio victim complete with iron lung. Polio was addressed during our initial episode. This is the immunization schedule recommended by the CDC for children ages birth to six years. If you look through these vaccinations, you'll see that they consist of most of the common childhood diseases, including chickenpox, hepatitis, measles, mumps, and rubella, polio, tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. Here is the schedule for children ages 7 to 18. You'll see that it includes flu vaccines, tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis, HPV, meningococcal, pneumococcal, hepatitis A and B, polio, measles, mumps, and rubella, and chickenpox. Some of these are optional and some of them are included if they were not done during early childhood. Finally, for adults, the CDC recommends that you get an annual flu vaccine. You should get a tetanus booster at least once every 10 years and get another booster if you have an injury more than five years after your last booster. You should consider getting a shingles vaccination. Adults over age 65 should have a pneumococcal vaccination. Meningococcal vaccinations are highly recommended for uh, people that are in the military or in college. Measles, mumps, and rubella, HPV, and chickenpox, if you didn't receive them as a child. Hepatitis A and B, and H influenza. During our first episode, we went over how vaccines work, the theory behind them, and how they're put into practice in public health. We also went over several of the uh, more serious diseases that we vaccinate against, including polio and the now non-existent smallpox. This time we're going to go over tetanus and meningitis, both of which are very dangerous diseases with high morbidity and mortality. And then we're going to touch on some of the less serious illnesses that are just extremely contagious and very prevalent. Fortunately, tetanus rarely occurs in the developed world, but the spores that cause tetanus are present in all dirt, soil, and things that we just come into contact with all the time. The problem with tetanus, is, or lockjaw as it's commonly known, is that there is no cure for it. The only treatment is supportive. The mortality rate is extremely high. It is a miserable, miserable way to die with very severe spasms, starting in the uh, jaw area and then extending to the entire body. Looking at these photographs, you can see that this position uh, caused by muscle spasms is caused by very light stimuli, such as a light touch, a loud noise, or a draft. They are extremely painful. Meningitis is a bacterial or a viral infection of the lining of the brain and central nervous system. Characteristics include a overwhelming headache, a stiff neck, and high fever. Sometimes there's a rash on the body which has a rather unique characteristic. It is a deep red rash. I've seen it uh, in children. If you take a clear water glass and gently press it on the skin over the rash, if the um, rash goes away, it's generally not meningitis. If it does not go away, it's very suggestive of meningitis. Once you have the appearance of the rash, medical care must be sought within a matter of minutes. Teenagers, college students, and military recruits are at high risk for meningitis and should be vaccinated. While this was covered in the first episode, let's take a moment and go over how vaccines work again. The basic component of a vaccine is a killed virus or a part of a bacterial coat or something that identifies it as a foreign body or non-self in the body. 
The body then mounts an immune response to it and develops antibodies against it. In some vaccines, a catalyst is added to enhance this immune response. In essence, vaccination primes the body to fight against a certain type of an infection. The antibodies that you develop from vaccination make it less likely that you will contract a disease. And if a population is vaccinated, there are fewer people in the community that have the disease, so your chance of being exposed to it is much less. Vaccination is a public health issue. The first illness we're going to address is whooping cough or pertussis. I have a short video here from YouTube uh, filmed by a parent and shared to other parents to demonstrate what whooping cough looks and sounds like. <coughs> Next, we have measles. Measles is one of the most contagious diseases uh, that it commonly occurs. If you are exposed to measles and you are not immune, you have greater than a 95% chance of contracting it. Serious complications include uh, inflammation of the brain, also known as encephalitis. Approximately 1 in 20 people with measles will develop pneumonia, and that is the leading cause of death. Because it is so contagious, this is a major problem in school districts that do not have a vigorous vaccination policy. Mumps can result in sterility, deafness, and inflammation of the brain or encephalitis. It is included in the MMR vaccine. Rubella, or German measles, is not as severe as regular measles, however, if pregnant women are exposed to rubella, they can have miscarriage or severe birth defects in their offspring. The MMR vaccine covers measles, mumps, and rubella. So many young people died of the virulent pan-endemic of Spanish flu in 1918, it lowered the average life expectancy in the United States by 12 years. Hong Kong flu in 1968 almost took my mother. I lost a healthy 45-year-old friend of mine to H1N1 flu in 2010. Hepatitis A is very common in the border regions of the country. We are currently having an outbreak of hepatitis A in Michigan. Hepatitis A is foodborne and hepatitis B is bloodborne. Vaccines are available for both. Pneumonia is a leading cause of death in the elderly. Everyone over age 65 is recommended to have a pneumococcal vaccination. To give some visuals, you'll notice on the left an outbreak of measles in the Somali population in Minnesota after they were targeted by anti-vaccination groups. On the upper right, you'll see outbreaks of pertussis and our current epidemic of hepatitis A in Michigan is demonstrated in the lower right slide. In our next episode, we're going to touch on some of the um, preventative vaccines, including HPV and shingles. We'll go over the complications of vaccines, both the real and imaginary, and touch on autism. I do think it's important to note that I'm going to allow comments with scientific evidence to be put in here, both pro and anti-vaccination. I will not allow anti-vax propaganda, newspaper articles, stories, etc. Let's keep the discussion scientific. In closing, let's go over the vaccination schedules again as recommended by the CDC in the United States. These are the vaccinations recommended for children from birth to age 6. Here we have the recommendations for school-age children. Recall that some of these vaccinations are recommended if not obtained when they were younger. Meningitis and rubella are two very key vaccinations for this age group. Finally, we have vaccinations recommended for adults of various ages. Please review these and ask your doctor if you have any questions. 
Please like and subscribe the channel to make sure that you see the next video in the series. This is Bob the Science Guy. Thank you for your attention, and we'll see you for the next video.